Hey, and welcome back to Hazmat Ops Training. I'm Joel. I get a lot of questions about air monitoring uh, for operations level response agencies, mostly fire departments. Um, I'm going to share with you some of my uh, likes and dislikes, pros and cons. Uh, so stick with us. We'll be right back. Hey, we're in Western North Carolina today. We're on the Blue Ridge Parkway, just outside of Asheville, North Carolina, uh, just uh, down the road from Cherokee, uh, if you're familiar with that. Beautiful country you see behind me here. Um, they don't call them the Smoky Mountains for nothing. Uh, there, it's a, it's a beautiful place. Uh, we decided to use this for our backdrop today. I'm glad you could join us. Let's get right into why we're here. So a lot of agencies are dispatched on situations where there's a carbon monoxide leak, there's a gas leak, there's, there's things that we get dispatched on, smells and bells, uh, if you will. So we have a responsibility to respond to those incidents, understandably. But what I wanna talk about today is some of the pitfalls for air monitoring. There's a lot of things to take into consideration here. So I'm not necessarily in this episode gonna give you the how-to or anything like that. I really wanna communicate the risks and, and the, the concerns for an agency getting into air monitoring. For me, the bottom line is air monitoring is a technician level skill. Now, the NFPA has provisions for ops level responders to be able to do air monitoring under what's called mission specific response requirements. And basically what that says is for your agency, uh, for your policies, for your administration, for your legal advisors, to put together a program, to put together a training program, to put together response policies, a number of different things that need to be considered. The authority having jurisdiction has the ability to put together that program to be able to serve the citizens for these responses that we get dispatched on. So when I'm asked these questions, the first thing that I ask that person back is, what are you doing? What's the problem? What's, what's the problem statement? And is that carbon monoxide? Are you in a highly residential area? Are you seeing a lot of carbon monoxide dispatches where you're having to go out into a home or maybe small businesses, that kind of thing, to, to respond to these carbon monoxide alarms? If that's the case, and that's predominant for your agency, then maybe we should double down on the carbon monoxide piece and not necessarily get into some of the other things, again, which I'm asked about a, a number of times and have been asked about a number of times over the years, and that's foregas instruments on an apparatus where there are ops level responders. To be honest with you folks, I don't like it. I, I think it's dangerous. I think it's a very slippery slope uh, for ops level response agencies to get into. Here are some things to consider. One, the training that needs to go into operating a four gas meter. Again, it's a technician level skill. So there's a number of, of other things with the instrument itself uh, that we need to be able to understand. What's the, the sensor reading? Is it reading percentage by volume? Is it reading percentage of the lower explosive limit? Is it reading in parts per million? It's not terribly, easy for an ops level responder with no experience to be able to interpret those kinds of readings when we probably are not getting the training more than once or twice a year. Again, herein lies some of the problem is with the training. I think most of you would agree, especially with smaller departments, with volunteer based or combination departments, a lot of folks have a very, very difficult time getting the, the required training, just the basic stuff. So when we start overlaying things like air monitoring and this mission specific response for air monitoring, you're looking at a, a lot more hours throughout the year and you're looking at a program, a training program that needs to be so intense that it's gonna require a number of hours on the front end as well as continuing education. 
there are other things to consider as well. Personal protective equipment. Do you have the right personal protective equipment? Do you know what the right personal protective equipment is for that particular response? Is it turnout gear in an air pack? Uh, is it some sort of chemical protective clothing? There are other things such as control equipment. Do we have the, the right tools to go along with the air monitoring piece to be able to do shutoffs and things like that? And at the end of the day, folks, here's the bottom line. Do we have the program written and in place, our personnel trained on it to be able to do these types of responses? If the answer is no, and you have these instruments on your rigs and your folks are not trained adequately, we're in some really, really dangerous territory. We're making decisions on our citizens' lives based on a very poor, if not non-existent in some cases, training program. We've got to have the policies in place so that we know how to build our training programs. It's one step builds on the other. An additional piece is our field testing. Most all the manufacturers for single gas instruments, four gas instruments, whatever the case may be, are gonna have a requirement for field testing. You may hear that as calibration gas, bump gas, those kinds of things. Most manufacturers require 30-day intervals for calibration. Uh, and then, generally speaking, most manufacturers will recommend that we bump test or confidence test, if you will, the instrument before each use. That in and of itself takes up a lot of gas. The gas is extremely expensive. And we want to make sure that we know this as well going into this process, that we know the cost. Most of the time we're looking at a thousand or so dollars for a four gas instrument. The single gas stuff, not quite as expensive, uh, but we're looking at a thousand dollars plus for a four gas instrument in addition to the calibration gas every year because it will expire. Uh, so there's things that we, that we need to know on the expense side, not to mention the expense of training, um, and those kinds of things that we may run into as well. So you may be saying, okay, Joel, you've told us everything not to do, but we still get dispatched on these calls. So, so what do we do? Again, what's the problem? If you're looking at a problem that's singular to carbon monoxide responses because you have a heavy residential area uh, in, in, for a response area, then again, let's double down on carbon monoxide look at what our problem is so that we can apply the appropriate strategy for the problem. If you're getting dispatched on a lot of gas calls, gas leaks, whether that be natural gas, propane, my, re my recommendation to you would be to talk to your service providers. Most of the time your service providers will have some sort of emergency response provision. If they don't, then that's a good opportunity for you to reach out and say, hey, you as a service provider, you, you don't have a very good emergency response piece. We get dispatched on calls where your customer has a leak. Let's work together to potentially increase that emergency response capability of the service provider. You can work a little bit with them to tell them some of the problems you're seeing in the field. They may be able to work with you to increase their availability to come out on the calls that you're responding to. Another option that we've seen across the country is combining resources with other agencies within your county, within your region, uh, to be able to accomplish some of these uh, capabilities, local capabilities, uh, but not have that capability duplicated department by department by department. So if you have, say for instance, if you have a dozen different departments in a single county, uh, those dozen departments may be able to pool their resources and uh, to be able to have staffed apparatus to respond. Again, it may be a countywide thing, it may be a regional thing, uh, but you have to be creative and think about what we're doing. Again, we want to make sure that we're responding to these incidents with trained, qualified folks that have been refreshed, but most of all that have been thoroughly trained on the front end of this process before we put them in that decision-making position, ultimately designed to fail if we've not constructed it the correct way. Now I've told you a lot of things that I don't like about this. I've told you a lot of things that are negative. I've told you a lot of things that um, are reasons not to 
do air monitoring using ops level responders. But I will say this, if it's done correctly, uh, then you could be very successful. Um, I come from a, a hazmat background, uh, from a technician level team, so uh, not everybody has the luxury in every part of the country uh, to be associated or close by to or have mutual aid options for a hazmat team. Uh, so they, again, you gotta be creative. There are a lot of options out there for us. Hey, thank you for being with us today. Don't forget to like, subscribe uh, to the channel uh, so that we can bring you more content. We'll see you next time. <laughs>